right. Good morning, Radiant Church. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see Portage. Welcome. And everyone who's watching online, I have a unique privilege today. Pastor Lee and Jane are taking some well-deserved time off. And so we have a guest speaker today, and I'm going to try not to take all of his time uh, bragging on him and his wife. But Pastor Mike and Jen Popenhagen are here. They're the lead pastors of Radiant Church in Jackson, Michigan, which is a plant that came from here uh, and started in 2013. And Mike will tell you more of the story, but prior to that, he was a worship leader here for 15 years and a massive and huge part of who we are as a church and who we are as our culture and our DNA. And he's a, a dear friend of mine and, and his wife and my wife are best friends. They talk to like 4 a.m., it's insane. But anyways, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I want you to just right now, begin to prepare your hearts to hear a word that is going to not just inspire you, but enable you to connect with the faithfulness and the miracle working power of God because Pastor Mike and Jen have lived that out and they're not special in the sense that God just rolled the red carpet out for them. They, they believed and they pressed in and they did the things that Pastor Mike's gonna communicate uh, to you today. And again, he has sons, three sons, who I had the privilege of being a part of in their lives as a youth pastor. And so when I go to, to his church in Jackson, they're leading worship and they're on the stage and literally I, I get emotional every single time and I just see the fruit of the kingdom of God at work at him, in him and in his family. And so I want you guys to please stand on your feet and give a huge, warm welcome home to Pastor Michael Popenhagen. Thank you, thank you. You can sit down, it's humbling. Uh, just, out of, just so I know, how many have recently started attending Radiant in the last seven years, basically, six, seven years? Okay, well, I'm almost half of you. Well, so you have no idea who I am. Uh, so, uh, small correction, I was here 17 years, Pastor John. Uh, not 15. So let me just, if, if you're new here in the last seven years, which ain't really new anymore, but, if you, but it's been a while since I've been here. So um, this church saved my marriage, uh, saved my life. It's 1996, just newly married, 20 years old, 21 years old, and young, we had a young child, and I didn't know how to be a dad, I didn't know how to be a wife, or a husband, certainly didn't know how to be a wife. <laughs> I know times are changing, but that's not me, no. Uh, <laughs> I am a man. I identify as a man. Uh, don't play that on the, I hope that's not online. Uh, <laughs> let me rewind this a little bit. Let me introduce my wife. That'll help me start over. This is my wife, Jennifer. Would you stand up and say hello to everybody? So we got in a very difficult fight in, in August of 96, and I determined I'm, I'm done, I don't want this. I, uh, we, had, we did have a child, and so I left. I was at a friend's house, staying, because I left where we were living, and I prayed a prayer. I did, I did come to faith at 10 years old, but I hadn't really been following Jesus. I just living my own life, pursuing my own things. And my life was falling apart as a, as a husband, as a dad, and so I'm at my friend's house, and I go into the bedroom, and I start praying, and I have my, my child with me. He's in there, and I just said, Lord, I, I never thought I'd be at this place in my life. And the Holy Spirit said two things to me, and I know this was the Lord because these wouldn't have been thoughts that come into my mind. I was just desperately praying, and he said, go back to church and get a Christian counselor. I didn't even know if Christian counselors existed, but I... But I heard that, and so I did both of those things. And my mom told me about a church that was starting here in Richland. And uh, it was the first uh, Sunday in September of 1996. I called Jenny up, and, I, and we, we, we talked some things out. And I said, do you want to go to church? And we walked into this church, September of 1996, and God used this place to heal us. This church, where you're at... <clears throat> I'll share more about my story throughout the message, but um, I want you to know you're in a healthy place. You have a healthy pastors. Pastor Lee and Jane, they're really good friends of ours, but they believed in us when they shouldn't have. They sowed into us, 
And God used this place to heal our lives and change our marriage. The scriptures say those who are planted in the house of the Lord, they'll flourish. When you go to church, uh, you'll flourish. You'll grow. And it wasn't a message series. It, it wasn't something someone spoke. It wasn't the community group that I was in or, the, or my involvement in the church. But it was all of those things working in our lives and healing us. So... Uh, just after uh, a couple weeks of being here, uh, music was part of the problem. Uh, uh, I, was, I had a, a dream to go into music it's, ever since I was a little boy. And uh, that was part of my problem is just pursuing that dream, neglecting the marriage. And so I had, I had laid down uh, my desire to play music. I just come to that point that this is the problem. So I set it aside. We walk in here. Next week, I come up to Pastor Lee, week two of the church plant, and I said, hey, I introduced myself. I said, hey, I want to get involved. And he said, well, what do you do? And I, I said, uh, well, uh, I'll do anything. Where do you need us? And he said, well, what are you good at? And I was avoiding telling him I was a musician because that was the whole problem. And I didn't play. I didn't grow up in a church where there was a band. We, we had a piano and organ. Um, so this was all new to me. And so I, I neglected uh, to tell him at first that I was a musician and um, there was a, so when he tells the story about worship leaders here, his first worship leader, no, it is not me. The, all those number one worship leader stories of somebody else are all awful. Uh, so I always remind him, hey, when I'm in the room, could you at least clarify it? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, he, he had, I, I was watching worship that morning and I'm like, God, is, is this like, it was bad. And I'm like, is this what worship's supposed to be? Like, is this guy, he, he, he played bluegrass in church. And it was like, boom, da, 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 And the, the, you know, the church is clapping on the upbeat. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know. But I, so I was like, I don't know if I want to be a part of that. Uh, what you guys have today, oh my gosh, wasn't that incredible? You should have just recorded it, produced it, put it out. Yeah, that was better than three claps, but um, <laughs> worship was powerful today. So I... He's just pushing me. I'll say, well, I got a kid. I, I can change diapers. I, I've got some experience with that. And he's like, well, is that what you want to do? We're like, no, I don't want to like, like changing diapers. But uh, he said, what are you good at? And so he pulled it out of me. And I, I said, well, I noticed you didn't have a bass player. So I could probably learn bass for you and play bass. And he's like, you don't know how to play it? I said, well, I'm a guitar player. It's basically two less strings. Can't every musician play a bass? Like, like. <laughs> Uh, just playing bass players, just playing. You know, you, you know how a bass player gets fired in a band when he shows up and tells the band, I wrote a song. <laughs> I'm just playing. I don't know. What, <laughs> you know how to stop a guitar player? Put music in front of him. We all play by ear. Anyway, so rabbit trailing, I'm coming back. So uh, I jumped in and started playing bass. It's a handful a month later, Pastor Lee invited me to become the worship leader here. Again, my experience was the bars. My experience was something else. So uh, four, uh, four or five months in, I get invited to be the worship leader. I started out on Wednesday nights, ended up leading worship on Sundays. The Bluegrass worship leader, he got fired. They put me in, the bar worship leader. So not much of an upgrade, but maybe a little bit better. Played at least something contemporary. So... Then four years in, after my marriage was healed, after Pastor Lee and Jane invested into Jenny and I, I became an associate pastor here, and we were here for 13 years full-time, 17 years all together. But I just say all that to say this really is home. Like, I just love Kalamazoo. I grew up in Battle Creek. I just love, love every time I drive in here, it never feels like I left. Like, I, I'll go back and... Uh, walk through the, I'll sometimes look at my old office back there, and who, did you ever figure out who was in my office? Not Still not yet? <laughs> do you know what you do yet? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll write you a job description, give it to Lee, he'll tell you. Um, but, so thank you for inviting me back. Can we pray before we get into the message? Yeah. You're like, that's not the message? Oh, it doesn't take forever. All right, let's pray. Father, I just love Isaiah 50, verse 4, that says, The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. Your word sustains us. 
Your word sustains the broken, gives life to the hurting, and that's what we want today. Father, I pray that you would speak through this message. We give you permission to speak. It's one message, but we all hear it differently, and that's the miracle of your voice. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts today in this room, in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you brought your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter uh, 17. I'm going to start out in uh, Daniel. So you, you go to 17, but they'll throw Daniel up on the screen. I know you guys have just finished a series called Stronger, looking through the book of Daniel. Basically a book of how to live godly in a pagan culture, in the Babylonian culture. And I know that Pastor Lee talked about the conviction on the inside of us. So I want to share one of my favorite verses just to launch this message from the book of Daniel. And it's Daniel 11:32. And it says this, people who know their God shall stand firm. And Daniel's talking about in a pagan culture when, when everything is defiling uh, all that's godly. There are some people who know God and they're going to stand firm. They're going to stay in their convictions. They're going to live the faith for God. And then it says not only do they stand firm, so it's just not that we're holding conviction. We're actually living out our conviction. We are taking action as the people of God. And I love that word. That our faith should have action to it, should have movement, should be propelling, should be going somewhere. The New King James says, the people who know their God, they carry out great exploits. I love this. Paul said it this way in the book of Ephesians. He said, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. There's something good God has for your life. And not only is there something good for your life, there's something good that's going to come from your life. There's a good work. There's, there is an exploit. There's something that the Lord will be leading us into to take action, to take hold of, a journey, a calling, a ministry, a purpose. And it says that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Our faith is a walk. Our faith is a journey. Our faith should be carrying out great exploits and taking action. So I want to share this today. Now, I've already said that uh, I come from, um, my background is music. I've always wanted to go in the music industry. I, ever since I was little, my, like when I was a, like four or five years old, my favorite singer was Elvis Presley. I grew up in the 80s, but I liked the 60s music. I come from a line of musicians. My great-great-grandfather was a musician. Um, my great-grandfather was a musician. My grandfather was a musician. My dad was a musician. I was a musician. Now, they were all atheists. So I didn't grow up in a Christian home until my dad gave his life to the Lord at 30, but he hated God, hated Christians, hated church, so it's miraculous that um, we all came to faith, but we did. But my grandfather was a musician who played with, with uh, artists that's from the Michigan area. His name's Del Shannon. He became an artist. Oh, some of you know that. How many know him? Oh, a handful of you. How many don't? Let me see that. So a lot more of you don't. Okay. Those of you who don't know whom and lifted your hand, how many of those who just lifted your hand and said you don't know him, how many of you know who Tom Petty is? Same people. Okay, so you know Tom Petty. So you know the song Tom Petty, Running Down a Dream? Remember that one? You remember the line, and me and Del were singing, little runaway, running down a dream. That's who Tom Petty's talking about. So Del, he's actually in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He is a... He is a, uh, he worked with Tom Petty. He, he, he's responsible for bringing the Beatles uh, to the United States of America. He opened the door for the British Revolution that just, you know, dominated the charts in the 1960s. I grew up in the 80s, but I love the 60s because of my grandfather's connection to Dell. He was in his band. But for those of you who don't know, I'm going to educate you. Uh, you. I bet you do know him. I bet you at least know his song. And uh, I'm not going to uh, sing worship this morning, because uh, so don't judge me. That's what I mean. It's a Gibson. All right. If you know it, sing along. If you figure it out, join us. So this was Dell's song. I'm a walking in the rain. Tears are falling and I feel the pain. Wishing you were here by. Yeah, that's all right. Sing along. To end this and I wonder, I why, 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 why wonder. Oh, see, you did know it. Why? One more time. Why, 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 why? She ran away, and I wonder where she will. Stay. Oh yeah, 
my little runaway. Run, 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 run away. Oh, give yourself a hand. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's who uh, Dell was. That's, that's Runaway. And so I pursued this dream of music. My grandfather played with Dell. I had a connection. I met him at 12 years old. I'm growing in, in playing music. God is opening doors, or at least I thought it was God. I was pursuing doors to open, and I'm recording music, uh, presenting it to Capitol Records in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm recording in Branson, Missouri, working with, with Vince, people who are working like Vince Gill and Garth Brooks. Like there was real momentum uh, for my life in, 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 t in the music industry, and then it actually became the thing that started destroying my life and destroying my marriage, and that's why I laid it all down before I came here. But at the core of that, and I tried to think, like, what drove me to that? And it was significance. I wanted to do something significant with my life, and I think it's what we all want. It might not be a music thing for you. It could be growing your business. It could be writing a book. It could be journaling. It, be, it could be you want to be the best mom or the best dad. It could be that you want to gain influence in the community to help those who are less fortunate. It could be that he's called you to start a business or, or to get involved at church. You just want to help out. At the core of all of these things that are urges and, and on the inside of us it is all God leading us to something significant. However, there's something that keeps us from doing it. A lot of us, we don't pursue what God places on the inside of us. We might be afraid we, or we feel like unqualified. Like, I can't do it. Like, I'm not smart enough. I don't have a good story. I don't have a, I, you know, I just, that's not who I am. Or maybe you feel disqualified. There's something in my past. I've done something terrible. God could never use me now. That, and all of those things, those are just the voices of the enemy trying to keep back what God has called us to do. So the end result is, as believers, we're living far less than what God has intended for us to live. And so how do we move past fear and unbelief? And that's what I want to give you three truths. The opposite of fear is faith. Because both paint a picture in your mind. Faith says, I'm anticipating and expecting this to happen. I can see God wants to do it. And fear paints something else. Fear paints failure. Fear paints disqualified. Fear just paints the wrong picture. But both are the same thing. So I want to give you three truths about faith this morning. And in Matthew 17, Jesus actually teaches uh, on faith. And this is the story where his disciples had a man come up to them and say, my son is demon possessed. Would you heal him? The disciples, they couldn't do it. They couldn't heal him. So what ended up happening is the, 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 hus or the father took the son to Jesus and said, your disciples couldn't heal my son. Will you heal him? So Jesus heals him. And well, this bothers the disciples because they wonder, like, why couldn't we do it? So they asked Jesus the question, and that's where we're going to pick it up in Matthew 17, 19. And they said, then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Jesus, what disqualified us? And he tells them, he tells them it, it's your fear. So watch it, watch how he says it. He replied, because you have so little faith. In other words, you're seeing in the wrong direction. You're not seeing what God sees. And I don't know about you, but if you can cast a demon out of somebody, that's a great exploit. And so like they're asking like, how do we do what you're doing? How do we live a great life? And, and he's saying like, it's because you're a little faith. Truly I tell you, now watch this. Now he starts teaching us on faith. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So I'm gonna give you three truths today of how to carry out great exploits through faith. Three truths about faith. And the first thing is uh, faith sees potential in small things. Faith sees potential. Jesus said, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed. Now, if I had a mustard seed, there's no way you could see it because it's such a tiny seed. So I brought one about four or five times, maybe 10 times larger. This is a sunflower seed. We have a bird feeder 
in, a, in the front of our, our home, in our, in our living room picture window, and the birds, they eat this seed. But uh, this summer, some of the seed fell on the ground, and one of the grains um, literally got planted in the ground, and it pro- we watched it grow all summer. This little seed produced a plant that was taller than me, the flower of the sun. It was this big, plus it had other ones sprouting off that were like this big. And I look at it and think, yeah, this little thing. Like, can you see that? Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a seed, it's going to produce something. Now, we know That if we plant a seed, it isn't going to happen right away. We know that it takes time for it to grow. And this is what Jesus is saying. Like, faith takes time. Faith, there's a process to it. We just got done finishing a series at our church called Habits. This was kind of the tag phrase that I used over the three weeks of this series. And I would say this to everybody. Little things, the little potential, little things done consistently over a long period of time have big results. That's why it's so important that we can see potential in the small things. Pastor Lee is so good at this. He could see potential in me that I couldn't. He knew I had a rough marriage. He knew I come from a bar background. He knew I was rough around the edges. I showed up one Sunday morning leading worship with a hickey on my neck. (laughs) And I wasn't embarrassed. I should have been, but I wasn't. I mean, he could just look past all of this roughness in my life and could see, no, there's something to this young man. He's seen potential in me. And when we went to plant a church in Jackson, Michigan in 2013, The year before, Pastor Lee sent Jen and I to get some training down south, and part of the training was that they were going to uh, have, uh, we had to go through this process to see if we qualified. So it was like this kind of like three or four days of testing, and then when they get all done, uh, they sit you down and they they share how you did. And it was a big deal because uh, all my funding to plant was going to come out of this organization, and I had to pass their examination, I had to pass their process, and uh, I, I show up and I sit down. I sit down with Jen and I, and they said, "Well, we we reviewed, uh, uh, you know, your background. We revealed. We just look at everything that you brought over the last few days. And here's what they said to me. And I'm I'm a worship leader here at this church, and we're probably about 1,500 people at the time. And I they said, uh, we don't think you have what it takes." And so, therefore, we're not going to recommend that you plan a church. And I'm just like, oh. And so I'm fighting back the tears. And so then they said, now, we want you to go work at a church that's going to kind of look like what you want to plant for a year, you know. And I'm, and I'm trying to say, like, no, you don't understand. Like, the church I'm at is like, like we're doing what I, and, um, but anyway, I didn't want to seem unteachable, so I, so I didn't respond so I get out, we drive back to the hotel. This was in, um, I can't remember what state we were, Alabama. We were in Alabama, so I send Jen back up to the room, and I grab the steering wheel of the rental car, and I call Pastor Lee. And I can't get two or three words out before I start crying like they said, I can't do it. They said, I can't do it, and now I'm not going to be able to plan a church because I need the $50,000 that they were going to loan us, and I don't, I don't know how we're, we're going to make it happen. And, and I'll never forget what Pastor Lee said. He said, oh, Mike, they didn't call you to plan a church. God did. Don't let what they say slow you down. You're going to do this. You're going to plan a church, and it's going to grow. And he just started speaking the potential in my life, and I'm so grateful he could see it. He could see it. So March, we move in August of 2013. We launch our first service uh, March 2014, so we're going to be in our sixth year anniversary next month, and when we planted you guys sent us, you, you invested into us as a church. You sent Jen and I with about $25,000. We raised 90 by the time we, we ended up planting a handful of months later. And a hundred and some people show up. 
and they said I couldn't do it. Then we keep growing. And about three years in, we're running two, 300 people. And we're renting this old Baptist church that just seats a couple hundred people. And we had someone come in and do analysis. Basically said, by the time, it's, if you keep the growth rate at where you are in 2018, you're going to be out of room. And so we went to the church and we said, we got to build a building and so 2018, we started saving, and, and we broke ground in September of 2018, 22 years of this as a church. Now we're in Jackson, and we're breaking ground. And this July, we were in our brand-new worship facility with over 500 seats. And now today, between 700 and 8 people show up every Sunday to our church because Pastor Lee could see potential in something small. Are you seeing this? So don't despise the thing around your life, that thing you think is insignificant, that book you want to write, the marriage that you want to strengthen. It, does, it seems insignificant right now, but turn your heart towards faith and say, you know, right now it looks like this, but I think it can look like this. Faith sees potential in uh, small things. And right now, maybe your marriage is struggling. It seems insignificant. It seems like a small thing. See the potential in your spouse. See the potential in your children. See the potential in that dream in your heart. See the potential in the thing that the Lord is speaking into you. Don't despise because it looks small. You're thinking, man, I'm just showing up and I'm serving every Sunday in the church. I'm telling you, I'm so grateful for every, everyone in children's ministry that invested into my kids in this church for 17 years so that today I have a worship leader because someone could see potential in the, our children depositing the faith into my kids do not despise where he's placing you you have no idea where that's leading to you but I'm getting ahead of myself so uh, number one faith sees potential in the small things number two faith believes the impossible is possible because he said this you will say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. When I read this, I think, how's that possible? Jesus is exaggerating. So I went and looked in the Greek to see if he was exaggerating, and he wasn't. He really means we can do the impossible. Blind eyes can open. The lame can run. The dream can come true. Your marriage can be healed. You can get set free from the lies the enemy's been speaking. You can move past the wounds in your life. The impossible is possible. You do not have to live in depression anymore. You don't have to be stuck in your brokenness and the cycles that are destroying your lives. Jesus takes the impossible and makes it possible. You don't have to stay in debt anymore. You don't have to live in poverty anymore. Jesus takes what seems impossible and makes it possible. Now, I grew up in poverty. And I still fight a poverty mentality. I, I choose not to live with that mentality, but the enemy will, will keep speaking it into me. So when we moved to Jackson, we planted the church, and we're going to build this building, and it's coming back that it's going to be $1.8, $2 million. Then these steel tariffs things happen in 2018, and it jumped up 500 grand. And I'm like, that was just like a month ago. How can you like, and they're like, no, no, it's a, it's a steel tariff. So I'm like, whatever. So um, we go to a bank and we had saved about $100,000. And in a year before this, in 2017, I'm at this, this bank and I'm, I'm telling them like, we just had an analysis and they're saying our church isn't gonna grow anymore. We're gonna reach a cap by September of 2018 and I need a new building. It's gonna take $2 million to do it. And uh, they said, well, how much you got saved? I said, I got about $30,000 saved up in the church account. And the, uh, his name was Justin. And I'm not down on Justin. But he laughed at me. He said, you got a ways to go. Why don't you go back and figure it out? So he kind of gave me some steps. And so I, I left a little discouraged, but I came back a year later. A year later, I come back and said, here's where we're at. It's $2.5 I have about... Uh, three or four hundred thousand dollars saved up, and this was in May of 2018. 
and we're, we know we need to break ground. And we were hoping we could have broke ground by that spring, but we had no funding. And we're looking at multiple banks, multiple nonprofit organizations that just help us, you know, help churches get uh, reach their vision. And everyone's saying no to us. So I go back in May of 2018, and um, they tell me I'm only loanable about, I can't remember, it was 1.2 million or 1.5. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you're like a million dollars off. Like, I can't, then they're like giving me, you're going to have to wait another year. And I said, I don't have a year, but they're saying, you're not loanable. And so I walk away discouraged, and it seems impossible because we're, at, we're, three, we're six years old now. All right, so we're a young church. So at the time we're having these conversations, we're like three and four years old. And banks do not give money to churches that are three years old. You know, it's like giving a 10-year-old keys to a car. Like, you know, you're growing, but you're not quite ready to drive, right? So that's how banks are looking at us, and, and I'm just frustrated because, like, the potential's there, but the banks can't see it, and I get it because they're not believers, but whatever. And so we're here at your Rise Shine Conference in May of 2018. I'm having all these conversations, super discouraged. And I'm sitting over in this section over here by the wall worshiping. And this young, I don't know who it was, but this young um, college-age guy, he's you know a couple chairs from me, and, and he gets a word. I don't know him. I'm worshiping. And... He, he turns to me and he says, the Lord just told me you got money problems. <laughs> I didn't say this, but I'm like, yeah, about a million dollars worth. <laughs> and you don't know. You don't know me. And, uh, <laughs> but then he, said, then, then he said this, and I just like grabbed a hold of his word. He said, the Lord just wanted me to tell you it's taken care of. You don't got to worry about it. So a couple months go by. And I found a bank that, that would loan us money if I could come up with another 200000 So it's a different bank. And so I call the other bank back, and I'm thinking, maybe I can play these guys. And <laughs> so I call bank number one, and I'm like, hey, bank number two said they're going to give me the loan, but I'm a couple hundred thousand dollars off. And I'm just wondering, I know you won't give me the $1.9 I need. Will you, will you give me a couple hundred thousand so I can get what I need. And he's like, well, where are you at, Pastor Mike? Now, this is a guy back in May. Just a couple months later, told me, no way. You're gonna have to wait a year. So I'm sitting there, and it does seem impossible, but finally, but I'm just like, and I'm, I'm like, Lord, we're just so close. We're so close. And so I, I, he says, well, what, where are your numbers at? And I'm, I'm sure like, our church is growing. Here's where we are. And he just, just randomly says, I can hear him like clicking while we're talking. And he's like, oh, no, we can loan you 1.9. I'm like, dude, you should have told me this in May. I've been discouraged not sleeping and all of these other things. You were telling me it was impossible back in May. Now you're saying, but he, I said, well, what do I need to do it? And he says, you need about 500,000. I said, well, I got 400 saved. I'm 100 off. And uh, so then I just thought, I'm gonna ask it. It's crazy. I, he's, what they're saying is I need 500,000 down to get the loan for 1.9. I got to invest 500, but I only had four. And I said, well, I'm only off 100. I said, would you loan me the other 100? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> and not only did that, he gave me another 100 on top of it. So they gave me a loan for $2.1 plus million dollars to get the $1.9 million. <laughs> And we've already paid that off, but God worked a miracle. That was impossible. That's impossible. I'm not saying this hasn't happened, but I don't know any church that's under five years old, that's built a building, has hundreds of people coming. We had a 67% growth rate from last January to this January. Because faith knows the impossible is possible. What's the impossible thing you're facing? Might be that hurting marriage. It may be some debt that you gotta get through. It may be you're believing God for a job or maybe a promotion. It seems impossible. 
It was uh, the head usher that was with me. I don't know if it was a security usher was with me yesterday. He was telling me that uh, he had wanted this promotion and didn't get it, was really discouraged. But then like a year later, they ended up giving it to him. And it seemed impossible because there, all these other people had more seniority, more time. But then eventually they could see his potential and he gets promoted. But it was impossible to him. Don't underestimate what God can do for you. Number three. Well, number one, faith sees potential in small things. Number two, God takes what seems impossible and makes it happen. And number three, faith produces unintentional outcomes. Faith produces unintentional outcomes. God gives you a direction, and somehow you end up over here. Have you ever had that happen? Like, you're thinking you're going this way, and then all of a sudden the Lord, you think you're going to be leading worship. I thought I was going to be here at Radiant at Richland for the rest of my life. Like, I love this church. I grew, my kids grew up here. Like, this is where I'm going to invest my life in that. I had 17 years here. I had no idea the Lord was going to uh, lift the grace off of me being a worship leader and then drop me into being a pastor because I never only spoken like two or three times. And I'm, so when the Lord's telling me you're going you're gonna to pastor a church, I'm thinking like, no, you, you got it wrong. I sing, Lord. That's easier because they give me the words in the back. Like, I, I don't know, like, uh, and uh, he's like, no, you're going to move over here. I had never intended to be a pastor, and I never intended to be a worship leader. But faith brought some unintended outcomes, and it does that. I love this about the Lord. My six-word motto is this, surprised by God, anticipating the future. Because that's what he does. So check out what Jesus says about this. In Matthew 13, I'll close with this verse. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is larger than all the other garden plants and becomes a tree. So that, read these red, red words with me, so that the birds, say this with me, the birds of the air can come and make nests. When I read that, I'm like, is Jesus crazy? Because that's not why you plant a garden. For the birds, Lord? Because if I'm a farmer and I'm planting mustard seeds, I'm not thinking about the birds, I'm thinking it's for culinary reasons, like mustard for my hot dog. That's why you plant a mustard tree. Mustard for the hot dog, Lord, not for the birds. But Jesus said, no, it's not for that. You'll get that. That's the intended outcome. The unintended outcome is for the birds. You know what a nest is? It's home. You know what the nest is? It's where you come back and you realize, you know what the mustard tree, it's provision. Your faith journey is going to create branches in your life that other people can come and land in. So when your marriage gets healed, it becomes a branch for someone else's marriage. You didn't intend it. All you were doing was fight for your marriage, and now all of a sudden, you're having influence with other people who are struggling. You didn't know that when you conquered that addiction, that one day the Lord was going to give you a voice so that other could, people could land in your branches of faith. It's the unintended outcome. I had no idea when I was walking into the blue devil's den in the Gull Lake High School when this church planted that the Lord was going to make me a worship leader four years later. I had given up on music. I had given up on my dream, but God had given me other plans that I didn't know was going to be the outcome of it. And then in 2004, Pastor, we're in this other building over here, and Pastor Lee is saying, I see thousands of people worshiping. I'm thinking, we're hundreds. Are you crazy? And uh, like he said, no, I see thousands of people worshiping in this place. We need to build a building. I'm just like, what? So we build this building. And I look at it, and I, got, I, I remember the first Sunday standing in this platform it's a little different it used to be wood and not round and not a hole this is all different <laughs> it's like blowing my story now 
and just seeing for the first time, we were about 500 people, 700 when we finally got in here and just watching this church begin to grow and bloom. I didn't know that I was going to leave. I didn't know my kids were gonna become worship leaders and they did. Because Pastor Lee threw out the vision. And I know that we have what's going on in Portage and the last few times I've attended, I've, I've drove to Portage and um, just seen what God's doing there. And I'm like, man, I, we, we had walked through that building, Pastor Lee and I in Portage 10, 12 years ago. And now like it's a, we didn't intend that. And now you got this prayer center and this prayer room in downtown. It's like, it's just all of this has been unintended, but it's been a beautiful thing. Because some people could see the potential of this church back in 2004. Now you're a church of thousands of people. I'll close with this story. When I came in last night to speak, they gave me a gift basket. And I, I took it home. I got up this morning and Jen was getting around and I was looking through the gift basket, eating the candy for breakfast. And, um, and I picked up this book that uh, I don't think I've ever met Corey. Obviously, I've seen him. But uh, by Corey called Reckless Love, a 40-day devotional. So I flip it open and I'm, I'm reading the introduction. And he tells the story. He says, I could have never seen that when I wrote this song, I would get Dove Awards, unintended outcome. I could have never seen a, I would get nominated for Grammy. I never knew that this was going to be one of the most sung worship songs around the world, unintended outcome. I could have never seen, I didn't know this until I read this, that people are tattooed reckless love on their bodies. I'm like, that's crazy, but whatever. Uh, no songwriter is sitting down in a room when he's struggling in life. I'm writing a song so someone can tattoo it on their arm. I'm, I'm going to get a Dove Award. This never was his heart. His heart was God unbroken. And I'm, I'm, I'm writing this song. Then he tells this story that one day Justin Bieber sings his song, posts it, and Corey's phone like blows up. He'll never tell you this probably, so I will. And uh, his phone blows up, but one of the most significant stories was that day a young man decided he was going to take his life and commit suicide. He Here's Justin Bieber sing this song he had never heard before. And he lives. And I'm reading and I'm weeping this morning. I'm like, God, it's an unintended outcome of a broken person writing a song out of this house, out of this place. And songs are blossoming out of this place because someone will take the insignificant moment of being broken and writing a song or writing that journal. You have no idea what the Lord could do with your journey. And I'm going to say this. Don't try to figure it out. I didn't intend any of it. I never intended to be a worship leader or a pastor. I stumbled my way through this whole thing. But I had faith. And if you have faith, God will get you where he wants you to go more than you want to get there. So you hang your head on it him and watch what the Lord will do faith can see the potential faith believes the impossible is possible and faith will produce unintended outcomes stand up I want to pray for you I believe in the room today. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? You have a dream in your heart. It's to fight for your marriage. It's to see that son or daughter that's a prodigal come back to Jesus. The Lord has given you a vision of something for the future. 
there's something the Lord has laid upon your heart and you've wondered how could I ever get there, Lord? And maybe you're hearing this message and it's just stirring you on the inside and you're like, yeah, I, I need to do a great exploit. I need to take action with my faith. And if that's you, I wanna pray for your dreams. I wanna pray for the vision God has placed in your heart. I wanna pray for your purpose, your calling, the, the thing that the Lord has put in you. Would you just simply lift your hand, both hands? Father God, you see these, there are dreams in this room right now. Lord, songs coming out of these young worship leaders. Prophetic words that will change the destiny of others. Books are housed in this room and in Portage this morning and online. Right now, you're given a dream for the future spouse. It'll become a dynamic marriage. Right now, you're planning that dream to launch a business, but their whole reason is to advance the kingdom of God. Right now, you're depositing dreams. Right now, there's some that are lifting their hands, and they say, I have no dream yet, but the Lord will give it. He'll birth it. He'll initiate it, and he'll raise it up. Holy Spirit, like a wave, just deposit life to those who he lift in their hands. Give us eyes to see potential. Give us the confidence to say, you can do it. I believe the Lord will move this mountain for my life. Father, and give us the anticipation to see the unintended consequences and outcomes of following you. Do that, Lord. You can put your hands down. If you're here this morning, I do not want to make an assumption that everyone in this room is following Jesus or has a relationship with him. So I'm going to get, again ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads out of respect for the people around you. If you're here, you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. This morning, you feel peace, or you might call it, I, I feel good, or you feel a pulling. There's something in you like saying yes, and you don't even know what you're saying yes to. That's God. Or maybe... You're a follower of Jesus. You might have given your heart at a, at a young age like I did at 10, but you've walked away from your faith. And today, you're in this place and you're thinking, I gotta go back in. I gotta jump back in. I gotta re-engage with my faith. If either one of those are you, I wanna pray for you and I promise I won't embarrass you, but I'm gonna ask you to lift your hands when I count to three. One, how you know your heart's probably pounding. Something on the inside of you saying, I should lift my hand. That's the voice of God. Two, if you're thinking about God, it means he's pursuing you. Three, quickly lift up your hands. Thank you. I see those hands to my left. I, I see those hands. Keep them up. Thank you. I see that hand in front of me. These hands over here. Thank you. The hands in the back. Thank you. Jesus, thank you. Father God, thank you. You can put those down. We're going to say a prayer together. And if you mean it, Jesus is coming into your heart today repeat after me father I'm coming after you and I'm choosing today to follow Jesus come into my life I pray you forgive me for my sin and heal me of my brokenness I need you Jesus I believe you died and you rose again for me and I believe today I'm a new person. I'm a new creation. Created in Christ Jesus for good things. In Jesus' name, amen.